الله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين بارئ الخلاق أجمعين باعث الأنبياء والمرسلين ثم الصلاة والسلام على خير خلقه العبد المؤيد والرسول المسدد حبيب إله العالمين أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين قال الله تعالى في كتابه الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وننزل من القرآن ما هو شفاء ورحمة وقال أيضا لو أنزلنا هذا القرآن على جبل لرأيته خاشعا متصدعا من خشة الله وقال أيضا إن هذا القرآن يهدي للتي هي أقوم ويبشر المؤمنين الذين يعملون الصالحات أن لهم أجرا كبيرا My dear brothers and sisters, my dear viewers Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Welcome to our show The very first episode of our show entitled Quranic Insights Which is a, a program, a lecture, a series of lectures based on the Qur'an, based on the tafsir of the Qur'an. In these series of lectures, we like to become more acquainted with this book that we've neglected most of our lives. We rarely read it. If we read it, we don't understand it. If we understand it, we don't practice it. If we practice it, we don't know its secrets and its deep meanings. The goal of these lecture series is to become acquainted with this book, the holy book, the greatest book in our lives, the holy Qur'an, Al-Qur'an Al-Kareem. Why have we chosen in these lecture series to discuss the holy Qur'an? The holy Qur'an is a book some might say there's hundreds of other books, academic books, books that, uh, that their authors have spent a lot of time on and research, books full of theories. But why out of all these hundreds, maybe thousands of other books, why have we chosen the Holy Qur'an? First of all, the Qur'an is not an ordinary book. Every other book is written by a human being, by a, a person, by a man. While the Qur'an wasn't authored by a human being. Not even Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. There are some, non-Muslims of course, believe that the Qur'an is a book written by our messenger, our messenger Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. This is wrong. We Muslims believe that the Qur'an from the beginning till the end is fully by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is one. Number two, the Qur'an is a book of guidance for us. This is why we'd like to concentrate on the Qur'an and make it the center of our discussion, the theme of our discussion. The Qur'an is a book of guidance. The Qur'an was revealed from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to humanity, to guide us, to bring us to the right path, to teach us. The Qur'an is a book of revolution. It's a revolutionary book, but not a political revolution, but a revolution to change our minds, our hearts, and our spirits. It's a book of change. It's a book of transformation. This is why we'd like to put the Qur'an as the central theme of our discussions. The Qur'an contains the foundation to our belief system. We Muslims, what do we believe in? Our beliefs, our ideology, our theology, it all stems from the Qur'an. There isn't a certain, a single idea or thought or belief that we Muslims adhere to if it doesn't have its source, its original source from the Qur'an. 
That is why the Quran is such an important book. In discussions, in debate, in dialogue, we have to come to the Quran. Those who disagree amongst Islamic schools, those who have certain beliefs, others have various beliefs, what should be the scale? What should be the scale between these schools of thought? A hadith? No. Why not a hadith? Because we followers of Ahl bayt we have certain ahadith that we believe are authentic and are correct, but our opponents wouldn't agree. They wouldn't accept our books. For example, if we tell them that we have a hadith in Bihar al-Anwar or al-Kafi or other hadith books in our schools of thought, our opponents doesn't accept these books, doesn't accept our hadith. If we were to judge them and judge their beliefs and ideology, but in their own defense, they mention us a hadith, for example, from Bukhari or Muslim or at tirmidhi or Ibn Dawood from these hadith books. We won't accept them. Because to, to us, followers of Ahl Bayt, those books are unreliable. And the hadith in them a great majority of them are unreliable. But whether you're a, a Shia Muslim or a Sunni Muslim, you won't disagree over the Qur'an. The Qur'an is one. No matter who you follow, which school of thought you follow, the Qur'an is one. We can always come back and resort to the Qur'an and say that let the Qur'an be the judge. What do you believe in? Do you believe that the Khilafah was based on Shura, let's come and see in the Qur'an. Is the Shura mentioned? Followers of Ahl bayt believe that the Imama is by divine appointment. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala appoints the Imam. Is this in the Qur'an? Let's come and see. The Qur'an can be the judge. And no one disagrees over the Qur'an. There is no school of thought that says, this is legitimate, this is not legitimate, this is authentic, this is not authentic. We all accept the Qur'an 100%. Yes, there might be a debate over the meanings of the Qur'an. And this is what we shall be discussing in these lecture series. This is what we'll be concentrating on. The meanings of the Qur'an. Thus the Qur'an contains the foundation of our, of our ideology and our theology. Our aqaid, our belief system. Everything that we believe in and adhere to is laid in the Qur'an. The Qur'an also has for us the foundation and contains the general principles and guidelines of our legal system, al-fiqh. The Qur'an has touched upon the general principles and the general guidelines in our fiqh system, in our legal system. Yes, a great, de a great deal of the details or not mentioned in the Qur'an. According to some scholars, that the verses that address uh, fiqh matters, legal matters, are up to 500 verses. Others say it's a lot less than that. With repetition, because some laws are repeated because of their significance and importance, with repetition they reach up to 500 laws, uh, 500 verses. Thus, it's much lower than that, it's, it's much less than that, if we don't count the repeated laws. These laws, these verses, give the general guidelines to our fiqh, to our legal system. For example, the Quran says, Allah has allowed buying and selling. Anything that's considered buying and selling is lawful. But Allah has forbidden Interest. Allah in the Quran states, Awfu bil uqud. If you make a transaction, remain truthful. Remain true. Remain, keep your promise and uphold that transaction. That means you can't break your transaction once you've started it. What is halal? What is haram? Is everything by default haram? And what is halal is. Uh, 
is a minority, it's, a, it's an exception to the law, or is it the other way around? Everything is halal, but the exception to the law is certain things that are haram. The Quran tells us that everything is halal. قُلْ لَا أَجُدُ فِي مَا أُوحِيَ إِلَيَّ عَلَى طَعْمًا أَطْعَمُهُ قُلْ لَا أَجُدُ فِي مَا أُوحِيَ إِلَيَّ مُحَرَّمًا عَلَى طَعْمًا أَطْعَمُهُ إِلَّا أَنْ يَكُونَ مِيتَةً أَوْ دَمًا أَوْ لَحْمًا Say that I do not find from the things that are revealed to me I don't find anything that is haram except the following meaning by default everything is halal but there's a couple of exceptions this is a general guideline. This is a general rule stated in the Quran. Without details. The details we receive from Rasulullah and after him, those who have authority. We follow of Ahlul Bayt. We believe those who have authority after him are the Ahlul Bayt. Others believe that at the, with the end of the Prophet's life, there's no more legislation. No one can legislate anymore. Of course, they disagree on this subject. Some say we could follow the Sahaba. If the, if the Sahaba stated a law or performed an act, that means that act is permissible. That means basically the Sahaba have the right to legislate. We disagree. We believe that the Sahaba do not have the right to legislate. Those who have the right to legislate are the Ahlul Bayt. We shall come to this, insha'Allah, in our series. And this is one of the topics that we shall discuss. Who has the right to legislate after Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Did even Rasulullah have the right to legislate? Was Rasulullah a legislator of law? Or it's only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Rasulullah was only showing the details. He was showing us the details. These are topics that we shall talk, talk about, inshallah. The Quran also contains a moral system, a moral code of conduct, ethics and morals, al akhlaq. The Quran addresses akhlaq, how a person should behave, what sort of manners should a believer have. Manners, ethics, morals. In fact, this is one of the central themes of the Holy Quran. The theme of akhlaq. The basis is in the Quran. The foundation is in the Quran. And yes, Rasulullah came to complete this mission. When the Quran was the main foundation, was the basis, Rasulullah came and continued. And he stated, إِنَّمَا بُعِثْتُ لُؤْتَمِّمَ Makarim al akhlaq I was sent only to teach people about morals and ethics. The Quran also speaks, the Holy Quran also speaks of former nations, former prophets, emperors. Basically, it contains a great deal of stories and history. Our history, the history of former nations and prophets, its foundation is laid in the Qur'an. Thus, that is why we would like to put the Qur'an right at the, at the center. And unfortunately, the Qur'an has been neglected. We have forgotten the Qur'an. Even in some of our beliefs and ideology, we have neglected the Qur'an. While the Qur'an should be the main source of our ideology. When we argue, when we defend our school of thought, it should be from the Qur'an. It's the most powerful, it's the easiest, most powerful tool to prove our ideology and our theology and our school of thought, our principles, our beliefs. Yet the Qur'an has been neglected. The Qur'an has been Forgotten. Rasulullah would complain, would complain that his nation has neglected this Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states in the Quran, 
وقال الرسول يا رب إن قوم تخذوا هذا القرآن مهجورا and the messenger our messenger would say oh Allah my Lord people have taken this book by abandonment they've, ad they've abandoned they've neglected they've ignored this book even though Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa himself would concentrate on the Quran he would tell us to read the Quran he would tell us to contemplate over the Quran and he himself stated in tarikun fikum thaqalain kitab Allah wa atrati ahl bayti ma in tamassaktum bihi ma lan tadhallu ba'di abada that i leave too weighty heavy too heavy things behind me the Quran and my family as long as you hold closely to both of them you shall never go astray you shall never go astray the reason why the, Muslim, the Islamic civilization went down was because they abandoned the Qur'an. Look at Muslims today. Compare Muslims today to Muslims a thousand years ago. Muslims a thousand years ago, the Islamic civilization was the greatest civilization in the world. Every other nation Every other civilization was benefiting and living off of the Islamic civilization. For example, when, you, when we read about the modern sciences today, like algebra, trigonometry, geometry, even biology, alchemy, chemistry, geography, these were all sciences founded by Islamic scholars, by Islamic scholars, alchemy was founded, chemistry and alchemy was founded by Jabir ibn Hayyan. Algebra was founded by Al Khawarizmi, and so on and so forth. These were the scholars that founded these sciences and other civilizations, especially the European civilization, have benefited from the contributions and achievements of the Islamic nation. A book called al qanun fi tib by a well-known scholar from the Islamic nation. This book was taught in European universities and European medical schools for centuries. The Islamic nation was known for its achievements, was known for its contributions. Even gadgets they would they would create. They would think of gadgets. The compass, the founders of the compass were Muslims. The compass that was used by Christopher Columbus to discover America, to find America, it was made by a Muslim. These were all achievements. These were all contributions. But look at Muslims today. Look at Muslims today. Today, Muslims are living off of the achievements of the West or the achievements of China or India. What have Muslims contributed today? What are their contributions? What are their achievements? Who's benefiting from them? Did they discover a machine? Are they discovering certain theories? How are they benefiting the world like they used to be a thousand years ago? The reason, the reason behind this decline in the success of Muslims, why Muslims became backward, was because they abandoned the Qur'an. Because the Qur'an says, ما أنت مسكتم بهما لن تظلوا. You will never go astray. You will never go behind. You will never go backward. You will never fail after me. But we, we Muslims, we Muslims abandoned the Quran. We failed. In a hadith, that on the day of judgment, three, three groups will complain to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. ثلاثة يشتكون إلى الله 
يوم القيامة the first one of the one of the three that will complain on the day of judgment is the Quran القرآن المهجور the neglected Quran the abandoned Quran the Quran that lies on the shelf collecting dust it's only there for uh, for people to see not people to read not people to contemplate over no the companions of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wa alayhi, when the when any verse was revealed Rasulullah would teach them 10 verses only 10 verses they would take these 10 they would learn to read them they would memorize them they would understand them and then they would practice them once they've done all the above they would come back to Rasulullah Rasulullah would give them more verses look at us today do we even read the Quran do we even pick up the Quran and read a page most of us don't even read a page from the Holy Quran even though today the Quran is available everywhere the Quran could be in our pockets on our smartphones on our iPhones or on our Samsungs the Quran in various languages with various translations and its tafasir and its exegesis it's all available but do we pay attention? Do we pay attention to the Qur'an? Or would we rather waste our time on our phones, on other things, on social networks, rather than open one page of the Qur'an and recite? Do we memorize the Qur'an? No. Many of us don't memorize the Qur'an. Haven't even considered memorizing the Qur'an and would not even consider memorizing the Qur'an. We memorize many other things other, our youth, mashallah, memorize songs by celebrities and singers and they, they listen to their music. But tell them, memorize a, a short chapter from the Holy Quran. Would they? We don't memorize the Quran. Even though we have so many narrations that emphasize on the memorization of the Holy Quran. To memorize the Quran. In fact, we have a hadith that says on the day of judgment, when a believer enters heaven, heaven has various levels. But how do you go from one level to the next? Are there, are there elevators or stairs? No, there's no elevators and there's no stairs. Only one thing can get you from one stage to the next. And of course, the higher you go, the better it is. And that's through reciting a verse from the Qur'an. You recite one verse, you go up another. You go up a, a stage. You recite another verse, you go to a second stage, third stage, fourth stage. The more you read, the more you read huh, from, from your heart, from what you've memorized, you go up. This means those who've memorized more Quran, this will benefit them when they enter paradise. How many of us study its meanings? The Qur'an concentrates on this. أَفَلَا يَتَدَبَّرُونَ الْقُرْآنَ Do they not contemplate over the Qur'an? Do they not think over the Qur'an? Do they not ponder over the Qur'an? There are some people that read the Qur'an every day in some parts of the world and specifically in some countries. They read the Qur'an and they memorize the Qur'an. If you open certain TV stations, you will see in some cities in some holy cities, there is a, congr a congregational prayer and the imam has memorized the Qur'an. Has memorized the Qur'an fully. And recites it very nice sometimes, with a nice voice. But come and ask him, what does this mean? This verse, إِنَّمَا وَلِيُكُمُ اللَّهُ وَرَسُولُهُ وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا الَّذِينَ يُقِيمُونَ الصَّلَاةِ what does this verse mean? Who was it revealed regarding whom? It was revealed regarding whom? What is the occasion of this verse? He either doesn't know or he pretends not to know. But in most cases he doesn't know. 
because most of them are like parrots. They only memorize. Like a cassette player. A cassette player will memorize. It, will, it could have the entire Quran, but can it give you the meaning? Absolutely not. Can a parrot, a parrot can memorize the entire Quran, but can it have the meaning? Can it understand the meaning? Absolutely not. The Quran emphasizes on this. To understand the Quran. Do they not ponder and contemplate over these verses of the Holy Quran? And lastly, do we implement the Quran? Do we practice the Quran? Or no? A wise scholar once said that the Quran was revealed from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so that Muslims practice it. But what did the Muslims do? They practice reading it. Instead of practicing it, implementing the Qur'an, they practice reading it. Indeed, we've oppressed the Qur'an. We Muslims have oppressed this holy book. It is oppressed and we are the oppressors before anyone else. Others, other people have oppressed the book as well. When you, when you see a person like Terry Jones burn the Qur'an, we shouldn't be astonished when we see some Muslims burn the Qur'an, but not physically, not physically, but morally they burn it when they don't implement the Qur'an. Rather, they, they go fully against the Qur'an. They contradict the Qur'an. This is a form of burning to the Qur'an, but not physical, but moral. Indeed, we've oppressed the Qur'an. We've neglected the Qur'an. And it's our loss. When we neglect the Qur'an, we are losing. The Qur'an doesn't lose. There are, there are plenty of books on tafsir in various languages, in Arabic, in Farsi, in other languages. In English, there are a few, very, very few, But there are tafasir, there are exegesis. And this lecture series is, has also aimed to explain the Qur'an, to translate the Qur'an and to explain the Qur'an and to, to, to offer a tafsir, an explanation, an exegesis of the Holy Qur'an. In English, of course, where there is a shortage of tafasir. In Arabic... There is an abundance of tafsir, And each tafsir has its own perspective. There are some that only look at the hadith aspect. They only concentrate on the hadith that have explained the verses. Others have a philosophical explanation. Others have a scientific approach. Others have a historical approach to the Qur'an. Others have a linguistic, verbal approach to the Qur'an. In Arabic. In Arabic there's an abundance. And in other languages. But in English there's a shortage. When it comes to books. And when it comes to lectures. Thus one of our objectives and aims in these lecture series. Is to provide a comprehensive academic exegesis tafsir of the Holy Quran in English. However with a modern perspective. Addressing modern topics, addressing topics that matter to us the most today in this day and age. A modern perspective to the Qur'an. A practical perspective. Something that can be implemented and applied and practiced. Because the Qur'an was not just revealed for the generations of 14 centuries ago. The Qur'an is new at any time and in any age. And we can derive new meanings, modern meanings to the Qur'an at any time. That's why the science of tafsir is ongoing. It can never be outdated. A mufassir 
someone who performs tafsir, if he applies the correct method, can bring out new meanings and new theories and new explanations to the Holy Qur'an. Ideas and thoughts that former Mufassirin never thought of and didn't cross their mind. Because as technology advances, as science advances, as human beings advance, their comprehension and understanding advances, they will discover things in the Qur'an that others never thought of that it didn't even cross other scholars' minds 100 years ago, 200 years ago, 500 years ago. But today, there are scholars that are discovering new thoughts, new ideas, new theories from the Holy Qur'an. Thus, the Qur'an is always contemporary. The Qur'an is never outdated. Never outdated. The Qur'an is always up to date. It's like you know, certain programs on your iPhone or on your computer, they need to be up to date. You'll get a message saying, update, update this, this program or that program. The Qur'an doesn't require any updating. It's updated by itself. But all it requires is someone bright, someone who understands the Qur'an, and someone understands his time to come and apply the Qur'an to his time and bring out new theories, bring out new ideas, bring out new discussions from the Qur'an. In a hadith by Imam Rada, alayha afdul salatu was salam, he says, Inna Allah lam yaj'alhu li zamanin duna zaman, wala li nasin duna nas, fahuwa fi kulli zamanin jadid. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not set the Qur'an for one period, one historic period, but not for other periods. Or for one group of people, but not for other group of people. No, the Qur'an is for all times, for all generations, for all people. فَهُوَ فِي كُلِّ زَمَانٍ جديد. The Qur'an at every time, at every historical period, is a new book. It's a new book. That means we can discover things from the Qur'an. We can discover ideas and thoughts and principles and theories that scholars before us did not think of. Perhaps because it wasn't applicable at their time. But today, our scholars are deriving new topics, new theories. A comprehensive Islamic an Islamic economic system can be derived from the Qur'an. This is possible. The Qur'an can also solve our contemporary social issues and problems. In every day, in every age, there are certain problems, there are certain issues, social issues. The Qur'an is the best guide and is the best solution for these problems. The Qur'an can answer contemporary academic issues, contemporary academic questions that are being asked at the world's greatest centers of learning, at the world's greatest universities. They are posing certain questions, certain misconceptions. The Qur'an has the ability today to answer these questions and these thoughts. Of course, we cannot do this independently from the teachings and the guidance of Ahlul Bayt. Because Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told us that the Qur'an has to go hand in hand with the Ahlul Bayt. You can't take one and leave the other. We are not, we are not like the one who said, Hasbuna kitab Allah. Hasbuna kitab Allah was a statement uttered by one of the Sahaba it represents a certain mentality that all we need is the Qur'an. And of course it had a political motive. It was politi the statement was politically motivated. We don't believe in this. Hasbuna kitab, that all we need is the Qur'an. No, the Qur'an has been explained, translated, 
by the Ahlul Bayt. We have to follow their guidelines because the Ahlul Bayt understand the Quran better than anyone else. Because Rasulullah told us to follow the Ahlul Bayt. And this hadith, Hadith al Thaqalain, that has been mentioned in our sources and in Sunni sources. In fact, it's a hadith mutawatir, meaning that we are certain this hadith was stated by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The Ahlul Bayt, they're the explainers, they're the translators of the Quran, Tarjuman al Quran. Only those whom the Quran speaks to will understand the Quran. And whom did the Quran speak to? The Ahlul Bayt. Thus, we cannot go on this journey, go on this road empty handed without the tools given to us by the Ahlul Bayt. We need the Ahlul Bayt on this journey with us to walk with us, to help us step by step, walk with us all the way in giving us a complete perspective, a complete insight on the Qur'an. And this is the journey that we shall seek in Qur'anic insights. Follow with us as we walk into this journey, this delightful, beautiful journey of the sciences of the Qur'an, the meanings, the theories, the thoughts of the Qur'an through the guidance of Ahlul Bayt. We shall see you in another episode. God willing, aqulu qawli hadha wa astaghfirullah li wa lakum. Walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen wa sallallahu ala muhammadin wa alihi al-tahirin.